You are listening to a podcast created by the Minnesota Alliance for Geographic Education. Our mission is to help you understand your world better through geography. This is one in a series of podcasts which is focused on the Bakken oil play in North Dakota. For the best understanding of how the Bakken oil field may be used in a geography class, listeners should first hear the explanation of why the Bakken is a geography topic by Dr. Lanegren. Each podcast contains visuals, clickable links, and chapter controls which are visible or available on some computers and devices. This podcast series is organized around the five themes of geography and addresses several Minnesota geography standards. Specifically, this podcast illustrates how the content from the North Dakota's Bakken oil fields may be used to teach the geographic theme of movement. The podcast begins with an explanation of the notion of movement in geography and then shows various ways movement comes into play in the Bakken oil fields. I am Fred Kunze, a member of MAGE. When you travel into the Bakken oil field, you almost immediately experience a sensory barrage of sounds, sights, and smells. You may never have experienced these kinds before. There is the sound and sight of massive highway traffic and construction vehicles, huge trucks such belching diesel smoke as they pull water, sand, drilling equipment and housing equipment and consumer products around the region. Even the smell of movement is everywhere. Oil drilling rigs, pumpers on oil pad wells and fracking pads each have their own special sounds, sights and smells as they play their roles in bringing crude oil from beneath the surface to the North Dakota prairie. Even among the people working in the Bakken oil field, you can hear movement if you listen closely. You will discern people there speaking with mannerisms and accents which are not native to North Dakota. They have moved to the Bakken area from other states and sometimes from other countries to find work. Geographers find all of this movement information useful. They are highly interested in movement because they use it to learn how people, goods, and ideas move from one place to another. Geographers study the relationship between those places and how change in one place may influence change in another place. A study of the Bakken oil field is a rich geographic source and an interesting way to bring a deeper understanding of one of the main geographic themes, that of movement, to your classroom. The first and most obvious part of movement is that single commodity which generates everything else. Oil, black gold, Texas tea, as the old song goes. One day he was shooting at some food, and up to the ground come a bubbling crude. Oil, that is, black gold, Texas tea. The Bakken oil field has far surpassed early estimates with regard to total barrels of oil production. The oil field has gone from one well in 1951 to over 10,000 wells and a benchmark production level of over 1 million barrels a day in the summer of 2014. Most of that increase has taken place since 2008. The oil is really flowing, or should I say moving. The movement of oil isn't just oil flowing physically. Oil movement involves new ideas coming to the Bakken. New ideas had to come to the Bakken before the oil could be removed from the shale oil fields. That production would not have been possible without recently improved drilling technologies such as horizontal drilling, measurement while drilling, oil shale fracking, and the use of swell packers, which are all being used in the Bakken oil fields. Bakken oil is moved out of the state mainly via trains and pipelines. The Bakken shale movement is enormous and is transported to the Gulf of Mexico and the East Coast refinery destinations by a fairly limited network of trains and pipes. Some oil finds its way to the West Coast. Eventually, some Bakken oil is sold even internationally. 
further extending the imprint of the Bakken. But as of 2014, there really aren't enough trains to carry it all. Pipelines are cheaper and safer, too. So demands for new pipelines, needed almost immediately, are being made. Permits are being debated in Congress, slowing things down. Conservationists fear environmental disasters and are fighting rapid pipeline building. Meanwhile, more and more trains are carrying oil. Again, conservationists fight the idea of oil trains crossing certain high-risk areas, such as rivers and towns and cities. In Minneapolis, you can see something in the newspaper almost every week regarding oil train movement across the state. And there is a constant demand for good workers. So, large numbers of people from all over the country, mostly male at a ratio of about 12 men for every female, have moved to the oil fields in North Dakota. But there are consequences for this movement, both in numbers and the types of people who move there. First, there is a large population increase in cities close to the oil fields. North Dakota has led the nation since 2010 in population growth and has grown 7.6% since that 2010 census. When seeing these numbers, keep in mind that the population of North Dakota is really only just over 720,000 people, ranking 48th in size. Some of those North Dakota cities with the largest population increases are Williston, Watford City, and Minot in the oil fields, as well as Dickinson and Bismarck, which are growing fast as oil-related service centers. Williams County, in the heart of the oil patch and the population there, has increased dramatically by the movement inbound of job seekers. One of the consequences of the inflow of people looking for work and the jobs available is that certain skills are needed. This must be provided by the college state system. Here's a response by Rita Matern of Bismarck State College as a question is asked to her by Jason Spies on the Building the Bakken podcast show. Absolutely. We are a two-year college, community college, focused on um, technical education. And one of our strong points as a college is energy education, which is approximately a fourth to a third of the entire college population. Uh, the energy program started in 1970 with our line worker program and has built since then, built, uh, actually building to meet the needs of the industry. So we're not creating the programs because we think it's something that somebody wants somewhere. We're actually creating these programs when industry comes to us and says, we need to find qualified workers. We can't find them. What can you do to help us train them? Williston, the main city in the county, and the most dramatic example, had its population shoot from just under 15,000 in 2008-9 to almost 50,000 five years later in 2014. Many workers moved to the oil patch as single men. Others have families back home. Still others move in with their families. This places demands on the infrastructure of the cities in terms of housing, water, and sewage systems, schools, medical services, fire services, police services, and just plain businesses. The oil field workers are paid much more than the non-oil field workers, and they have money to spend. But there just isn't enough of anything, and the oil field communities are scrambling to catch up. There aren't enough places to live. So man camps, which are very small housing units about the size of camping trailers, have been built by the oil companies and others. Most of these structures are very, very small and very basic. Other housing is being built, causing a boom in the construction industry. Meanwhile, existing rental housing has gone through the roof. A survey from the Apartment Guide ranks Williston as the highest place in the United States to rent. A single bedroom, 700 square feet apartment rents to almost $2,400 a month. That is more expensive than the equivalent apartment in New York City or Los Angeles, California. Other parts of the infrastructure are being stressed by the tremendous increase in volume and type of traffic, airport traffic and oil being moved on tracks. The cities are using oil money to build out the infrastructure New roads, bypasses, schools, airport runways, water towers, consumer shops, and businesses. 
may be seen under construction everywhere. Police are being added because of the increased number of calls resulting from the often doubling of a city's population. The high wages provides challenges for non-oil field employers, however. Employers, including such city services as garbage truck drivers and school bus drivers, are hard-pressed to keep or hire new workers because they can't compete with the oil field wages. When school districts can hire new teachers, the teachers often can't afford a place to live. In some cases, school districts provide housing to attract teachers. In the end, of all the things related to movement in the Bakken, there is nothing more obvious than the pressures put on by the roads and highways. Large 18-wheel trucks are needed to haul water, sand, oil, chemicals, equipment, and other load types, and they choke the highways. Everyone who works in the oil patch also seems to drive a pickup. Long delays at intersections in some cities have resulted in bypasses being needed. Traffic accidents have increased along with the noise and air pollution. Movement, it would seem, is not always clean, cheap, or noiseless. The Minnesota Alliance for Geographic Education is a nonprofit group of teachers and others. Our goal is to help learners achieve enhanced geographic literacy by improving geographic education in the state of Minnesota. In addition to this podcast, numerous other podcasts, as well as lesson plans, workshops, and other teaching resources may be found on the Minnesota Alliance website. Background music is courtesy of Jim Hogue of Decora, Iowa. Aerial photographs were provided by the generous and enthusiastic permission of professional photographer Mr. Vern Witten of Fargo, North Dakota. Thank you, Vern. Some sounds were from soundbible.com.